Dear viewers, welcome once more to our YouTube channel. In today's video, we shall look at the events that occur, the events that take place before we find ourselves in the situation of sepsis. We want to look at, in short, the pathophysiology of sepsis. Remember, most of our patients who die from sepsis, they don't even end up in intensive care units or high dependency units. Because we lack them actually most of our settings they're supposed to be having these units but unfortunately we do not have so we have to take care of our family members of our loved ones of our community members of our friends in our clinics in our health centers in our district hospitals in our regional hospitals in our central hospitals the overwhelming majority of the patients that die from sepsis so they end up not reaching these sophisticated areas and that is why it is important that if we have to reduce morbidity and mortality if we have to reduce the deaths from this condition we we'll definitely have to understand how it comes about and that's why we have to talk today about the pathophysiology of sepsis we defined sepsis in our last video as a life-threatening organ dysfunction that comes as a result of a dysregulated response to an infection so there must be an infection if we have to say there is a systemic overwhelming injury to the system it starts first with an infection but this is what we have to understand remember it has been difficult for clinicians to be able to manage sepsis well or identify patients with sepsis because of the different terminologies that have been used to talk about this condition if you can go back we we'll know of uh, infection we we'll know of inflammatory response syndrome systemic inflammatory response syndrome you know of severe sepsis top of sepsis top of septic shock so in order to be able to identify specifically that these are patients with sepsis the terminologies have been coined down and that's why we talk now more of infection sepsis and septic shock so today we have to look at how sepsis comes about So when we say there is a dysregulated response to an infection, there are systems that comes in. A lot of systems in the body are dysregulated. We can talk of the pro-inflammatory system, the anti-inflammatory system, the microcirculatory system, the hormonal system, at the cellular levels. All these systems are overwhelmed. All these systems are dysregulated. And that is why we find ourselves in self-inflicting injury. Because of this, we are bound to be able to say, okay, we have to switch from thinking, identification, management of infection, to identification, management of sepsis. It shifts from a local infection and starts overwhelming the whole system. Remember, we also differentiated between sepsis and septic shock in our, in our last video. So when septic shock ensues, there is a reduction in oxygen and nutrient supply to the, to the tissues. And this reduction in oxygen and nutrient supply to the tissues causes what? It leads to cellular stress due to hypoxia. And this cellular stress leads to the release of substances at the level of the cells and the tissues. There are these substances again that will cause what? Self-inflicting injury. They will cause a self-inflicting injury. And that's how the process will continue. And our cells and our tissues will continue to be, to be injured. So, the injury that takes place at the level of the cells and the tissues is really rapid. The progress from infection to sepsis or when sepsis set in the progress of 
cellular and tissue damage is rapid. And because it is rapid, it is important that interventions that have to come into play must be rapid. Remember we always say that each second, each minute, each hour that passes, the likelihood of someone dying from sepsis is increasing. And because it's increasing, our interventions need to be timely. And these in, the important interventions, there are three folks. We have early and targeted administration of broad spectrum antibiotics. Why do we say broad spectrum? Because most of the infections at the onset, they are always non-specific. We can't identify that this infection is this or this or that. Maybe a patient comes with meningitis, will take maybe two hours, three hours to say it to, to uh, diagnose meningitis. But now, we we'll identify that there is an infection. But because we are not specific with that particular infection, that source of infection, we administer broad spectrum antibiotics. And we recall that the commonest broad spectrum antibiotic in our localities, in our clinics, in our hospitals, is septriazole. Now, we need to, we need to foster tissue perfusion. Tissue perfusion with what? With fluids. And when septic shock ensues, we have to use vessel pressures to be able to send fluids to the cells and the tissues. Also, we need to eliminate the source of the sepsis or in other words, the source of the infection. For example, if the patient is having a ruptured appendix, in managing with antibiotics, administering fluids or a vasopressor, we also need to do what? The surgical intervention needs to take place so that the source of the infection will be eliminated. Before we continue, when we have an infection, what happens? Like a mild infection, like a common cold, what happens? If, if we take some rest, we take, we have, uh, drink enough fluids, we take enough fluids, we can easily eliminate some of these mild infections just with these basic interventions. Because these basic strategies join with our innate immune system, we'll be able to eliminate these infections but most is other other strategies like what other strategies like uh, cleansing of scrapes and cuts strategies like doing an incision and drainage to eliminate uh, an abscess removal of a dove when we have an infected gum these are all strategies that are aimed at doing away with an infection now, when these strategies cannot work, or when we have severe or serious infections, we go to the hospitals, we go to the clinics, to the health centers, and our physicians will be able to prescribe antibiotics, possibly to kill the microorganisms, to kill the bacteria. All these strategies are aimed at eliminating the, the infections. But now, in a situation of sepsis, in a situation where sepsis is setting in, these interventions will not be able to eliminate this tragic condition. And that is why there is a combination of interventions to target these other more systems that are being dysregulated. So we have to put more interventions instead of just using antibiotics. So when sepsis is setting in, First of all, what happens? We have said there are these viral, bacteria, and fungi products that are secreted in the system. And the fight between these products and our innate immune system, the fight between these products and the antibodies in the system Injures our cells and our tissues. This is generally what we summarize as inflammation. Now, when this fight 
between these products of microorganisms overwhelms the, 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 the locality where the infection is. It begins to take the, the whole system. It engulfs the whole system. And when it starts attacking the cells and the tissues of other organs, we find ourselves in a situation of what? Of systemic inflammation, systemic injury. And we have said, this is aggravated by what? It is aggravated by the substances that are released. The substances that are released when our cells and our tissues starts fighting an infection. We're saying that it is aggravated also by the injury, the self-inflicted injury that is the, of the substances that are released at the level of our cells and our tissues. Because of hypoxia, because of hypoperfusion, there is cellular stress, hypoxic cellular stress. And it is this hypoxic cellular stress that will put more injury to the cells and the and the tissues because these substances that are released will in turn inflict more injury to the cells and the tissues that are releasing them and remember this cellular stress comes from the fact that what the fact that hypoxia and hypoperfusion leads to less oxygen supply to the cells there is the cellular structures are damaged. We can name the cellular structures like the DNA, the chromosomes, and the mitochondria. And we often say that the mitochondria is the, is the powerhouse of the, of the cells. When we say it is the powerhouse of the cell, we mean it is, the, it, it, it is in charge of uptaking oxygen. It is in charge of the uptake of oxygen is in charge of using this oxygen what to produce energy the energy that our cells will in turn use to to work the energy that we will use to do what to do our daily activities so when these cellular structures are damaged the uptake of oxygen is reduced the production of oxygen is reduced because the octave of oxygen is reduced, because the production of oxygen is reduced, we are bound to, to suffer. When the cells and the tissues are injured, they start going to the different organs. Remember, the organs are made up of cells and tissues. And when these cells and tissues are injured at the level of the different organs, what happens? Our organ starts failing. I would like us to, to use the word decomposition, rotten. We borrow from the Greek word, the ancient description of the word sepsis. They use the word decomposition, something that is rotten. So if you can mentally picture your cells and your tissues, your patient's cells and your patient's tissues as rotten, as decomposing, then you can imagine when you look at an organism that is decomposing, how your cells and your tissues will look like because of sepsis. You can imagine how dysfunctional your cells and your tissues will be. Imagine your part of your body decomposing, rotting. That is why we say sepsis is a critical condition. It is a serious condition. When there is this injury at the level of the brain, what happens? We start having patients with delirium. Our cells and our tissues of the brain, they are suffering. When the lungs start being injured, I always like the word decomposition because it describes, it gives a mental picture. Even if it is not the same thing, it, it is trying to tell us how our cells and our tissues will look like because of sepsis. So you see, you see that the, the lungs, they start decomposing, they start rotting, describing it from our professional clinical terms. There is injury to the cells and the tissues of, of the lungs. And when this happens, we find our patients, we find our loved ones, we find our colleagues, our friends in a situation of what? Acute respiratory distress syndrome. 
when our kidneys are injured, what happens? When they decompose, what happens? When they rotten, what happens? We end up with acute kidney injury and we are bound to go for dialysis to be able to cleanse the system of waste products. These, these are the events that take place before we end up with an organ dysfunction syndrome. Most of our organs become dysfunctional. So we can already see shifting from an infection to sepsis to multi-organ dysfunction syndrome. So these are the events that occur before we end up with sepsis. So it's crucial that we have an understanding, a simple understanding, a mental picture of how sepsis comes about so that we should be able to prevent, we should be able to identify and treat it easily when it comes. It is a treatable condition and that's why it is important that we understand how this comes about. You can already see how the clinical picture of sepsis is going to look like. This is going to be a discussion of another day. And we are going to talk about it. We are going to talk about how our patients will present, how they will be different from a patient presenting with an infection. So dear viewers, dear friends, if you enjoyed this video, remember to like and share our video so that the, we can increase the community of this YouTube channel so that our loved ones, our friends, our colleagues can be prevented from dying from this critical condition. Stay blessed and stay safe. Bye-bye.